progress. Okay, let's begin with a word of prayer. And dear Father in heaven, we are so thankful for the Sabbath and for the fellowship that we can have, for the blessings of this past week and the sorrows. And we invite your presence into our midst, into our hearts, into our homes, into our lives, that you can speak to us, that you can teach us. We pray, Lord, that as we study together, that you can guide and direct us and help us to understand uh, the truth that comes from your word, that you can correct us in our thinking and understanding. Be with us now in this study, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, happy Sabbath, everyone. And I uh, hope you all had a good week. And it's nice to see everyone. Now, um, the study today is a little bit different. Um, not something I normally do. That is, I shouldn't say I normally do. I sometimes will look at things that other people have put out that wouldn't, we wouldn't necessarily agree with everything, but we can learn things by looking at how people study the Bible. And um, what you see here is, is not um, on the screen there. This is a study by a guy named Ralph Myers. Now, I had been talking to him back in July. I, I found out just a little while ago that he passed away on August 1st. Um, from complications from COVID. So I, I had actually invited him to the study and found out that he had passed away. So that's sad to hear. Um, now he, he was only 66, so not a very old guy at all. Um, so, so this study, it would have been nice to have him here to help us, but we have his notes. Now I did send out a PDF. And in that PDF, it has a link to uh, 666man.net and 666beast.net. So right at the top of the study. So I'm just going to switch over there and show, we're going to go to the study. <clears throat> so there you see it. So that's Ralph Myers. And um, this site that I got this from was actually another site. And this document, this PDF, if you look at the date it was created, uh, was in 2002. So this is a, um, a study that was done quite a long time ago. Now, Ralph Myers himself first came up with this study back in 1994. And everybody make sure you have your microphone off unless you're speaking because it creates noise. So just thank you. Um, so, so if you think about back in 1994, I actually remember in 90, I talked last time about, uh, we had a pastor, Dennis Crabb, who was using Revelation 17 to count the popes. And the way that Dennis Crabb was doing it is he was counting the number of popes since the Lateran Treaty. So the Lateran Treaty in, in, back in 1929, he was saying, well, that would be um, where you would start to count. Now, there was a lot of problems with that study, because the question is, why would you count the Lateran Treaty as so-called the time of the end? And why would you, you know, five are fallen, one is a problem that you would have there. And we're going to go through some of these things we did last time. Is when you're looking at Revelation 17, here, let's go there. So we will come back to this paper, of course. We're going to go through it. So in Revelation 17, here's what we're studying. Now, I should backtrack a little bit for somebody who's maybe just jumping into this study and hasn't looked at what we've done before. But we looked at Revelation 12, 13, and 17, and we have this beast, which has seven heads and ten horns. But there are differences. The beast in Revelation 12 is pagan Rome. The beast in Revelation 13 is papal Rome. And the beast in Revelation 17 is modern Rome. And, and specifically uh, is going to address the Sunday law. Uh, that's when 
it's it's not yet when this this vision is is sort of depicted that is the prophet john is at different times in these in these visions he's brought to a, a particular place and here in revelation 17 he's brought to the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters so this is at the end of the world with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication so he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness and i saw a woman sit upon a scarlet colored beast full of names of blasphemy having seven heads and ten horns so we know that if he's carried away in the spirit into the wilderness at least this is the way that we have always understood it this would be at the end of the wilderness and the wilderness or well, i'm not sharing the bible sorry about that i thought i clicked on and shared it but i guess i didn't okay so here we are in the bible and um so we're uh when we go to the wilderness where would we put the wilderness what what's the argument for, about the wilderness what's the time of the wilderness Time in a wilderness would be uh, uh, five thirty-eight up to seventeen ninety-eight. So. Yeah, and and we would see that when we look at Revelation twelve, right? So in Revelation twelve, you have this great red dragon, and this woman's going to flee into the wilderness. Now, the wilderness is the United States. Would we agree with that? Yeah, I can see that coming out yeah. of the year. Yes. Earth yeah. the wilderness. That is the United States before it becomes a nation. Correct. The now, earth, when, when we say that, we say it's the earth. The earth helped the women. Now, we know, of course, the wilderness initially, uh, during the 1260 years, everything's in Europe. So when the woman fled, flees into the wilderness, uh, part of it is it's fleeing from uh this 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 persecution right so this persecution now is going to be this period of 1260 years but we know that that 1260 years doesn't begin in the united states but it ends in the united states because the word earth is going to help the woman right that's that's how we understand it yes yeah. Yes. So, sounds like they could work. Okay. Um, where is this? And that's going to be later. So when the dragon saw that he was cast onto the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man child. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place where she is nursed for a time, times, and half a time from the face of the serpent. And the serpent cast out his mouth of water as a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood and the earth helped the woman so the earth here specifically is united states but the earth is part of that wilderness period so maybe that's the best way uh, to describe it so we have this earth the wilderness is this 1260 years but at the end of that wilderness period you have the earth helping the woman and and that's going to to be the place where people go so that they can flee from this persecution, this papal persecution. So when we look at Revelation 13 and we deal with this period at the end of the 1260 years, even though it's referring to this beast that is papal Rome, which includes that whole period of 1260 years, we know that we're being brought to the end of it because the second beast is going to arise. And the second beast, this other beast, comes up out of the earth, where this first beast comes out of the sea. So the sea is Europe, the earth is the United States. So since the earth helped the woman at the end of the wilderness period, this, this second beast, this earth beast, is the United States. But it has horns like a lamb and it spake as a dragon. So we know that this is referring to the period of the United States from its beginning to its end. Because when it speaks as a dragon, that addresses the Sunday law. So it's dressing that whole period of time of the United States. 
right? So it's, it's going to come up to this 600, three score and six. Here is wisdom. Let him that under, hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 603 score and six. And of course, this requires wisdom. And, and what is wisdom? Knowledge. From a biblical perspective. Increased light. Okay. Understanding. Uh... I guess. Okay, we know that wisdom is personified in Proverbs. And, and so what is being personified there when it talks about wisdom? People know what um, chapter I'm referring to? The last chapter. It's the last chapter of Proverbs? I think. Oh, I'm thinking of Ecclesiastes, never mind. No, you're thinking of Ecclesiastes. It's not the last chapter. Um, I can't remember which chapter it is. It's it's somewhere in here. I can't remember. Here. Let's see if I can find this. I should know it because I've actually... Um, done a I've, I've recited the the entire chapter oh that's why i'm having trouble um in, in a public speech when i was in university it, oh, it's chapter one or is it chapter eight yeah it's chapter eight doth not wisdom cry and understanding put forth her voice right when you when you read this this is wisdom that's being sort of personified. Um, and it says, the Lord possessed me in the beginning of his way before his works of old. I was set up from everlasting, from the beginning where the earth ever was. When there were no depths, I was brought forth. When there was no fountains ab abounding with water, before the mountains were settled, before the hills was I brought forth. While as yet he had not made the earth, nor the fields, nor the highest part of the dust of the earth, when he prepared the heavens, I was there. When he set a compass upon the face of the depth, when he established clouds above, when he strengthened the foundations of the deep. So what is this talking about, this wisdom? What is wisdom? Because it says we need wisdom. Well, in, in chapter 9 of Proverbs verse 10 it says the fear of the lord is the beginning of wisdom so it's okay so wisdom would be would be acknowledging the lord and his commandments so. okay yeah when wisdom hath builded her house she hath hewn out her seven pillars right so there's there's this this idea of wisdom it's not just knowledge it's a certain type of knowledge and understanding, which comes from the fear of the Lord, which comes from God himself. So when it says that, you know, um, I'm in the wrong chat book here, just hang on. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast. Um, You know, this is not, um, I don't know. When people talk about, let's say we talk about milk and meat, you know, there's the, the sincere milk of the word. There's the basic principles of the oracles of God, the first principles of the oracles of God. But there are things that, that the Bible describes as wisdom. They are the deep things of God. And, you know, you often hear people say, well, the gospel should be simple enough that a child can understand it, or we should present things on a child's level because things are too difficult. But when we deal with something like wisdom, this is something where God directs us. That is, human minds cannot conceive of the things that God wants to reveal to us, the things that he reveals in his word. They can't come about by intellect. 
And so when it says here is wisdom, it doesn't mean that intellect does not have a part to play in understanding it. But this is something that's given to us from God. It's not something that man just figures out. We have to ask for it too. Yeah. So it comes from a fear of God. It comes from God's direction, his providence, his guidance. And, and often when, when people like us, we're studying something and we have all these numbers and all this math and all these different things, and people say, well, I can't understand it. It's too difficult. But the thing is, it's something that comes from God. It's in his word. And God often in his word will say that we need to have wisdom. We can't just um, approach the Bible and say, well, it needs to be easy, right? So there are some things that are difficult. But God shows them to us. That is, sometimes there are things that are, once we see them, we think of them as obvious, Now, notice in Revelation 13, it says, here is wisdom. We also have in Revelation 17, verse 9, here is the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. So there's two places in Revelation, well, three actually, where wisdom is mentioned. Um, but the other one is not. It's just talking about uh, that God has wisdom, you know, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto God forever and ever. Which is seven different characteristics. Um, so maybe that is relevant in some way, Revelation 17, 7, 12. Um, wisdom has to do with these ideas that this movement has been dealing with. That is, it's the hidden things of God. Palmoni requires wisdom. To understand the numbers of the Bible requires wisdom. But when we say wisdom, I don't mean intellect. I mean, it takes God's direction and guidance. So Heidi and I, we did a study this morning. We went through um, recounting how we came to understand July 18th, and just in a very simple way, not all the details. But one of the things that was evident was that the God's leading happened all the way. His providence led us to situations and circumstances um, that without his leading, there's no way we would have come to understand the things that we did. That is, circumstances such as us being in Arkansas, when by the legal situation that I was in, I, I couldn't leave the country, but we got our passport given, I had my passport given back to me inexplicably just before I went to Arkansas in 2018. And me being there on October 13th, doing the calculation, uh, again, God's providence that I was there and lots of other situations like that, the way truth came to us, the way the things unfolded. And, and so those things, to understand those things requires wisdom. So we are being told when it comes to counting 666, we need wisdom. And also we need wisdom to deal with the seven heads that are seven mountains upon which the woman sitteth. So in this movement, we're looking at Revelation 17 and Revelation 13, and both of these chapters say that we need wisdom. So it means that there's something there that God, we need God's providence to show us. And the way that he shows us to it, the symbols that he shows us, are evidences that God is leading us. But God's just not leading us. He leads all kinds of people. He gives his wisdom to whoever is seeking it. And just because somebody's seeking wisdom at one time and God uses that person, doesn't mean that that person will always be used. Because this is something that is 
is something that God dispenses. It's not something that man has control over. And, and the greatest minds may, not la- may lack wisdom. They may not have wisdom. So one of the things that we've seen in this movement is that God has given us instruction on how to study his word. So he's given us all these symbols. He's given us line upon line. He's given us Miller's rules. And if we follow those rules, which include obedience, that is faith, we can trust that God can lead us and that he can show us the evidences that he's leading us. So in this study of Revelation 17, the reason why we're studying it is that it came up again a few weeks ago, well, it's actually on Christmas Day, when Colin presented a study on Revelation 17, connecting it to Daniel chapter 11, verses 1 and 2, dealing with uh, the the kings of the United States. That is, he's going to take uh, the seven heads and he's going to apply them to the United States. But he does it in a very particular way. That is, he takes, he's in a sense marrying two different prophecies, one from Daniel and one from Revelation, putting them together to illustrate something. And and actually you could say maybe three, because he's going to take uh, Daniel chapter 11, 1 and 2, Revelation 17, and Daniel chapter 3 which is also connected to Daniel chapter two. So Daniel chapter two, of course, we're familiar with the image, Babylon, Media, Persia, Greece, Rome, pagan Rome, papal Rome, the United States and the UN, right? And and we can take those same symbols and lay them off over Revelation 8, 17. So we've done this before, the five that are fallen, Babylon, Media, Persia, Greece, Rome, uh, pagan Rome, papal, the one that is the United States, the one that is to come, it will continue continue for a short space, and then the eighth, which is of the seven, right? So, so this we're all familiar with, and this is what we're studying. We're trying to understand this. And other people have approached this or this Revelation 17 in various ways. So we're now going to go to Ralph Meyer's paper. Now, um, you know, sadly, he passed away on August 1st last year, um, and I'd been talking to him uh, about this, and so I've had this um, this study on my computer for a long time, and I've read over it here and there. And um, so when Colin had brought up Revelation 17, well, I started looking at this and thinking about it again and see, is this relevant? And can we look at how somebody else has interpreted Revelation 17 and see that it's complementary to what we already understand? And and we can examine his methodology and say, does it follow uh, Miller's rules? Um, And it's different than a lot of the other studies I've seen with the popes. So as I mentioned before, you know, Dennis Crabb, who used to be our pastor in Warburg, you know, he was using the Lateran Treaty and counting from there uh, the popes. But there was the time problem, right? So that time problem was, you know, where are we? How can we, how could we take Revelation 17 and put it at um, 1929 instead of 1798? So one of the things that um, Ralph Myers does is he doesn't uh, put it at the Lateran Treaty. He puts it at 1798. And so we're going to go through this study. It's not many pages. It's uh, seven pages altogether. Um, So you'll see as we go through this. I'm still sharing the Bible, so I've got to switch. Thank you there. So this is an extract from an entire study. The entire study is a lot longer, but this 
this extract was done in 2002. And, and so there are some differences from what you see on the on the site now. And, and you'll see that. So we're going to go through and, and, and see what he was doing. His study, uh, he first began in 1994. So, you know, that would be 27 years ago, 28 years ago. Uh, this is a Bible study which, if followed methodically and prayerfully, will surprise and no doubt shock many. To others, it will be a wake-up call to the times in which we are now living. This study adheres strictly to the biblical rules of interpretation set out within the Bible itself, and in doing so, positively identifies the man with 666 as the number of his name. The books of Daniel and Revelation clearly identify the beast as the Roman Catholic Church. There are over 50 characteristics within Bible prophecy that identify the beast or the Antichrist, and every single one, without exception, is fulfilled in the Roman Catholic Church. There's not another power on this planet in the entire history of the world that matches every one of these precise and prophetic characteristics. Furthermore, all the popes throughout history have numbered their names as most monarchs do. For example, Pope John Paul II has the number two as the number of his name. Therefore, if we add up the numbers of the name John Paul, we will arrive at three. That is John Paul plus John Paul II equals three. One plus two equals three. If we add all the numbers of the Pope's names in the time period specified in Revelation 17, do you not know what number Pope John Paul II equals? We are told to count the number of the beast, Revelation 13, 18. And counting up two and including Pope John Paul II, we arrive at the number 665. This means that the next Pope having the, a name not previously used, will have the number of his name equaling 666. So we're going to see this. We're going to look at, at his, how he has done this. Now, you could see he's making this prediction back in, two, that, well, this is 2002, but it's back from the 1990s, where he's looking at Pope John Paul II is the Pope, and if you add up the numbers of the names of all the popes, it adds up to 665. So back then he was predicting that the next pope would have a unique name. So if you look at it here, this, this chart kind of goes over two pages, unfortunately. But you can see here he has all the Pope Piuses, all the Pope Leos. So these are the names of the popes that has existed since 1798. And he's, he's not counting the popes just from 1798, at least their numbers. He's counting all the Pope Piuses and all the Pope Leos and all the Pope Gregories and all the Pope Benedicts and all the Pope Johns, all the Pope Pauls and all the Pope John Pauls. And then he's saying that the next pope is going to have a new name. Now, who is the next pope after John Paul II? That had a new name. Well, who's the next pope after John Paul II? Benedict. So it was Benedict. So at this time, when he looks at Benedict, he has 14 Benedicts, I, I think. Actually, he might have 16. I'm just going to see what he has on the next page. Um, yeah, he has 14 Benedicts. So he's going to have this list here. You're going to see um, this list being added up. I'm going to actually switch over to this other diagram because it's better. So just hang on a sec here. Okay. So now here is, this is what's on his website now. He's going to say, see that you're going to have uh, 12 Piuses, 13 Leos, 16 Gregories, 14 Benedicts, um, 21 Johns, six Pauls, two John Pauls, and then one Francis. Now, we know that the next one wasn't Francis after John Paul, which is what he was predicting back in 2002, during the time that John Paul was the Pope, before he died. So, so he, he predicted that the next Pope 
would be a pope who has a unique name so that it would have the number one. Now, is anybody not clear what, what he's doing here? It's clear to me because I've looked at this lots of times. So he has this number here on the right. So he says there's 12 piouses, but why does he have 78 um, over here? You know, why is there 78 there? What has he done to do that? First, let's look at this. And for Leo, he's got 91. Right, there's that 91. Anybody know what he's doing? No. Okay. No, I don't, I don't understand that three part. Three no. plus four plus five. Okay, right. So Rosanna has this idea. So if there is John Paul, remember he took John Paul. So the first John Paul is John Paul one. The second Paul is John Paul two. So one plus two is three. If you had a John Paul three, you would add that to the three you already have. Now, the significance of this has to do with the idea that 666, this number is derived from Babylonian astrology. And, and how many constellations are there? Um, anybody know? 36? 36, right? Now there's um, the signs of the zodiac, there's 12 of them, but there's 36 constellations. So the zodiac is the ecliptic, that's where uh, the planets and the sun and the moon uh, travel. They travel this path in the sky, they travel through the zodiac, but there's 36 constellations. Now they also divide the sky into 10 decans. Well, decans is the Roman name for it, or, or 36 decans, pardon me. So a decan is 10 degrees. And so there's 360 degrees in a circle. So they divide the sky into these uh, 36 sections, you know, at least along the horizon. And that's how we get this 360 degrees. It's 36 times 10. Um, so 666, is a mystical number by adding one plus two plus three plus four plus five plus six plus seven all the way up to plus 36 you get the number 666 and you have this thing called a magic square and a magic square is uh um where you have six by six squares and you get it so that each row, you write the numbers 1 to 36 in these six boxes, these six squares, and each row of numbers will add up to 111, both horizontally and vertically. So this, this idea of these 36 squares adding up to 666 is this mystical number, and it's related to the number 36, but it's derived by adding the numbers in that manner. So that's really what he's doing here. He's taking these, um, I'm just going to go. I thought I could just do undo here, but it looks like I can't. Isn't he just adding, like for Pope Pius 12, if you add 1 through 12, he gets 78? Yeah, 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 12, exactly. And, and yeah. you can see then 13, well, you just add Another, 13, 78, yeah. 91. And 14, you add 14 to 91, you get 105. Correct. Yeah. Okay. So that's how he's doing it. And then he's adding up all of the names of the popes that have, hap that have existed since 1798. And, and he's adding them all together. And he comes up with this total that's uh, 666. Now, remember, back in 2002, with John Paul II, he had 665. Pope Benedict hadn't come yet, but he said something about this that was quite interesting back in 1998. Um, so I'm gonna go here, just hang on. And, and I'm gonna go over this a little bit again, just, just to understand what he's doing here. We're gonna go through the, the whole paper, but... Um,
So this is, I'm going to have to share, share this screen here. Okay. Now, in order to come up with the list that he did in, in 2002 or back in the 90s, he had to see that there was something called antipopes. Does anybody know what an antipope is? That's a pope that holds the, uh, the reign, basically, of the church but they are regarded as being heretical. Right. So they're, they're usually deposed um, in some way. And, and, and I was reading up the whole history of all the popes in Wikipedia, and it's pretty confusing. But, I mean, there are, are, are miscounts. So when they tried to figure out the number of the popes, you know, it was pretty easy if the pope before you was, you know, Pope Pius II, well, and you became Pope Pius III. But sometimes they were, had lost track sort of of who, which popes do we count? So they have an official count of these popes. You know, for instance, there was no Pope John the 20th. Nobody ever took that title because of how they were counting Pope, uh, pope John's. So, so we have a Pope John 23rd, um, but actually, you know, there was no Pope John 20th. So it, it, it's kind of confusing. I, I, I don't know if I want to go into deep detail on that. But here's what he said on March 22nd, 1998. He says, so far in my study, I figured that there will be a new pope shortly. This new pope will only reign for a short term, unknown duration, but short. He will then be followed by the Antichrist. Though the next pope would ultimately become an anti-pope, to due to his being deposed the count will remain at 665 awaiting the antichrist pope who will not adopt the papal names but use his own name this results in adding the one to 665 so what he says in 1998 is we're at the number 665 but the next pope is going to be an anti-pope that is he's not going to count it's not going to be the next pope that's going to complete the number. It's going to be the Pope after that. So he says here, I had the sense of mind to see that there was a fork in the road and made no firm prediction, but insisted that the outcome would be the determining factor in which direction it would go. It would be either be a Pope bearing a single use of a name, and this would then complete the count, or he would adopt a name already used and subsequently become an anti-Pope. So when the day came that Karl Ratzinger was elected and chose the name Benedict, then I knew that he would ultimately be deposed as others had before him. It would be another seven years before the next transition would take place. Pope Benedict had resigned under suspicious circumstances, facing criminal charges, and opted to frame the excuse of old age and feebleness as an excuse to exit his pontificate. It still remains a possibility that he will be deposed as an anti-pope, considering his direct role in directing the cardinals around the world to shuffle the pedophile priests around and cover up the sex abuse scandals that predominated the news of the time. It is most certainly a crime worthy of his deposition as having been a legitimate pope. Um, so, he had already dealt with these anti-popes before in coming up with his official count. So we're going to go back to his paper and go through his process here. So does it kind of make sense? So he's, he's got this number 666 that the Pope's names, the number of their names will add up to 666 from 1798 till the Sunday law. And, and he has this situation where, well, it looks like the next Pope is going to be the one, he's going to have to have a new name in order to get this number 666. Now, the significance of 665, what is the significance of 665? Does anybody know? We found this in the study of Ezekiel. I don't easily recall that. Okay. 
Ezekiel's second vision, what is the date that it occurred? The, the vision of chapter 8. Sixth day, six months, or sixth day, sixth you close. month of the fifth year. It's the sixth year, sixth month, fifth day, right? So he has this vision one day short of being 666. And there's lots of significance in this because remember, Ezekiel also has a period of 666 years, which he's counting from Jehoiachin's captivity. So when we're looking at the sixth year of Jehoiachin's captivity, and then you're going to look at the sixth month and the fifth day, it's, it's one day short of being the symbol of 666. But remember what happens in that vision. He's going to finish that vision. That is, he's going to act out this event, which he does that night. And when he finishes and comes out of that vision, it would have been the sixth day of the sixth month of the sixth year of Jehoiachin's captivity. So that number 665 becomes significant in that it's one short of 666. But Ezekiel's vision of eight and nine, even though it occurs on that date, is completed on the date that symbolizes 666. So hopefully without going into that, people can see the significance of that. That's uh, Ezekiel eight, you said, right? Yeah. So yeah. So when you go to Ezekiel eight, his here, I mean, I'll switch over there. I mean, there's no reason to rush through this. Um, so in Ezekiel 8, it came to pass in the sixth year, in the sixth month, in the fifth day of the month, as I sat in mine house and the elders of Judah sat before me, that the hand of the Lord God fell there upon me. So remember, he, he's sitting among the elders of Judah. In his third vision, which is Ezekiel 20, uh, certain of the elders of Israel came to inquire of the Lord. When we studied Ezekiel, we addressed why they're called elders of Israel and elders of Judah. Um, so, which is an important point, but anyway, we're not going to go into that point right now. Now he's going to have this vision. Of course, we're familiar with, uh, the four abominations, and then we're going to deal with the mark that's going to be put on, um, the, those that sigh and cry for the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. That's Ezekiel 9, 4. And then he's going to continue this vision. He sees the glory of the Lord leave the temple. Uh, there's the judgment of the will, will uh, the, um, uh, the wicked counselors, Israel's new heart and spirit. There's all these things. And I think it's I'm trying to remember if it's at the end here. Yeah. And it says in Ezekiel 11. Um, and so he's going to go and he's going to, take out all of this garbage out of, um, or, or not the garbage. Um, he's going to transport his, his goods through the wall. He's typifying what's going to happen with Zedekiah when Zedekiah tries to flee Jerusalem. Um, and then it says, afterward, the spirit took me up and brought me in a vision by the spirit of God unto Chaldea to them of the captivity. So the vision that I had seen went up from me. And I spake to them of the captivity, all the things that the Lord had showed me. So this is going to be the next day. So he transitions from day five to day six in this vision. So it's, it's, it's pretty interesting, um, the connection between the 665 and the 666. So we're in this history as well, if what this guy is saying in his study is correct. So he's saying that you're going to have John Paul adds up to 665, and the next one's going to be 666. But then he says, we could have an anti-pope. Now, Benedict is already a very special situation. He's going to resign. And that's not something that a pope does. Now, he resigned because there was... I mean, the, the excuse was his health. Does anybody know much about 
what he's talking about this this scandal why benedict resigned because he resigned quite a while ago and it's and he's obviously you know not dead yet yeah i remember a little bit of that yeah yeah so i haven't heard much yeah now he hasn't been deposed which ralph meyer is saying well he could be deposed still you know he hasn't been deposed yet but if we're going to take uh uh, his name, and, and we're going to have to look at this. He's going to address how we get this count, how he gets the count 665. So he says, um, here's wisdom. So he's going to quote both Revelation 13 and Revelation 17, where it talks about wisdom. And there are seven kings, five are fallen, one is, and the other is not yet come. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. And the beast that was and is not, he even, even he is the eighth and is of the seven and goeth into perdition. So he says, as I considered the elements of the prophecy that numbers the 666 beast, and knowing the beast is represented by the papacy, then thinking of the fact that the popes have put numbers on their names, I decided to see how the numbers of these names added up. Since I knew of the prophecy of the 1260 year papal rule, I considered that the year 1798 was relevant to this beast number. I began counting the numbers of the popes from 1798 to the present. I saw that the number of names they have, they have used is seven. And I noted that this matched the number of the heads of the beast. Seeing then that the seven names they have used appeared to fit the seven mountains kingdoms, I did an estimated count of the numbers I saw. The answer was within a very close proximity of 666. So I knew that if I could get the exact facts, the exact number could be counted to the present time. I encountered an ordinal rule that an anti-pope has no count, as the number he would have used is taken by the next legitimate pope who takes that same name. This is demonstrated by the papal line of Stephen. I noticed also that there was no John uh, the 20th, no John XX. So by eliminating the two anti-popes, John the 16th and Benedict the 10th, and eliminating the missing John 20, the count now had now come to exactly 665 with John Paul II. This would only leave one to complete the count to 666. The Antichrist is expected to have a count of one because as Jesus stated in John 5, 43, I come in my father's name and you receive me not. If another shall come in his own name, him ye will receive. Now, of course, that's, you know, kind of an interesting interpretation of that verse to apply it to the last pope. But we, we do many things like this all the time. So I just want to look at, at these popes just so you get a better picture of it. Now, what I have here is a list of the popes. Pope Pius VI is the one who's taken captive on February 15, 1798. And he's followed by Pope Pius VII. And then there's Leo XII, and then Pius VIII, and Gregory XVI, and Pius IX, and Leo XII, and Pius X, and Benedict XV. Now, he's going to argue that Benedict XV is... Benedict the 10th is an anti-pope, that is, he was heretical pope, but they still had kept the count with Benedict the 15th. So technically Benedict the 15th should have been Benedict the 14th because you have an anti-pope in there, Benedict the 10th. Um, and then you have Pius the 11th, Pius the 12th, John the 23rd, but there is no John 20, and there is no John 16. That is, he's, um, uh, it's kind of complicated to explain. I'm gonna, if you can look on Wikipedia, if you read up uh, Pope John the 20, they will go through and explain that. I don't know if I wanna do that, but, so the count of the Johns, you're not gonna count a John 23. And then you have a Paul the sixth. So that's the first Paul that we've had since 1798. And, and the first John. And then you get John Paul I, who reigned for 33 days, and then John Paul II. 
and then we have Benedict the 16th. But he's going to argue that Benedict is going to be an anti-pope, as was Benedict the 10th. So we would have 14 Benedicts that we would have to add up. And then we have this unique Francis. Now, you know, we could do different things. Like I thought, well, what if I add, you know, six plus seven plus 12, et cetera. And, you know, if I add them all the way up to Pope Francis, I think I get um, 167 or something like that. So I was just adding, not adding like he was, you know, one plus two plus three plus four all the way up just adding the number of people, adding their numbers. Um, I didn't go through the gematria and try to see if I could add those up, but you know, maybe that would work. Maybe we would find something interesting there. But, but he chose to do it in the way that we would do the Babylonian magic square, you know, adding them up successively for each of the seven names. Now, if, um, you know, if, you know, if we didn't have Benedict, um, you know, and we had had some other completely different name that wasn't in those, that would have disproven his, his view. That is, if you would have had um, not, because Francis is the first Francis, but let's say if you would have had a, a Clement, you know, Benedict had chosen the name Clement, then his prediction would have failed. But the fact that he chose a name that was in that list already, because there's only seven names that you could have, and that the eighth name would have to be a unique name, and Benedict is not a unique name for a pope. Francis is. So when he approached this, and, and so when we look at this and we look at our parallel, our understanding, here's a person who's made a prediction based on something that he studied. And we still haven't studied whether his, his argument is valid, but he worked something out with some insight. And as he worked it out, he came to make a prediction. And, and you can see that based upon his prediction, Francis does fit the bill as being 666 if we see Benedict as an anti-pope. Now, he's not been officially declared an anti-pope yet, but it doesn't mean that he won't at some time, maybe even after he's dead or something. You never know. But at this point, it looks like his prediction has, has worked. But we can see that there still was a problem, Benedict, but he has already worked out the reasoning for somebody being an anti-pope, and he all prior to Benedict being elected, so you know, 1998, so long before Pope John Paul II had passed away, he already had this caveat, right? This idea that the next pope could be an anti-pope. Question. Yeah. If um, if a pope is executed or killed, would that be considered a anti-pope? No. No, it. Because that has happened. No, you're, you're a valid pope. It doesn't matter. You have to be uh, not seen as a valid pope. So Benedict is is almost fitting into that. One is he he's not the only pope that's ever resigned. There's another one. Um, and I don't think it's one of the names that we have here. I kind of remember who that was. I thought it was maybe a Clement or something, but I have to look it up. But But Benedict resigned, which was also... And, and resigned under sort of a scandal. So that that has weight to his his idea here. So when when we look at that list again, I'm just going to go back to this list. You can see Pope Benedict is the 16th, but here in this list, he's going to have 14 Benedicts. That is, he's not going to count Benedict the 16th. He's going to take him as an anti-pope, even though he's not officially been declared an anti-pope yet. And he's going to remove Benedict X, who has been declared an anti-pope. He's also, when you look at John, notice there's only 21, he's, even though John 23rd is the John since 17, he's the last John before uh, Paul. 
But that's because there is no John 16 and there is no John 20. So he says the count should be actually 21 Johns, 14 Benedict, Benedicts, 16 Gregories, 13 Leos, 12. Now, most of these, their count agrees with the count of their name, but he's going to count the actual ones. So he's not going to count antipopes. And so he's going to argue benefit Benedict the 16th is an antipope. But you can see that this isn't as simple as he's, you know, it's not a simple thing that is you have some complexities. You have to deal with, you know, these anti-popes and you got to get this count to come out right. But the fact that he had this predictive value that there would be a pope with a unique name, and that hasn't happened for a long time. I mean, you could say John Paul is a unique name um, because there's John Paul I and John Paul II. But um, Francis is definitely fits the bill and and then you have of course 666 this number that he is he's created by doing this now we're going we're going to look at this in a little bit more detail the the as we as we go through this but is this kind of making sense to people what he's done yeah. Yeah, it's amazing i never yeah okay yeah so i mean there's there's definitely we can see what he's doing the question is is his the way that he's doing this the way that he's coming to this conclusion is it is it valid um so he says the interplay of heads and names used by the popes in 1798 display an interesting scenario the first head pious was followed by the second head leo then reverting back to the first head pious before introducing the third gregory the jostling of names occurs until John appears, and then it moves in a straight procession to the sixth head, and then to the seventh head. Thus the prophecy by stating that five are fallen, it allows for the interplay of the names. But then when it comes to the sixth and seventh, it requires a straight progression without reverting to any other previously used name. So we would say, in 1989, now we know that there was Pope John Paul I, but we could also look at Pope John Paul II as being at the time of the end in 1989. So we can say five are fallen, one is. So we can take this and we can attach it to our understanding of the time of the end. Do you, do you, is that does that make sense? Yeah, it makes well, sense so far. Okay, so so the five five are fallen. One is, and one is not yet come. He's the seventh, but he's also the eighth, right? Is is that how we understand it? And how would that fit in? In, in this context, it's a little bit different than we do it with Revelation 17, but why would he be the eighth? Or am I am not understanding this proper, properly? Eight different names. Okay, eight different names. Okay. So one one other point. Uh yeah. I put my hand up a while ago. Okay, I didn't see it. <laughs> you uh in history there have been ten popes that have resigned. Okay. Which are the names? Just a moment. Okay. I was just pulling that together. Okay, we have Gregory the Twelfth. Okay, so Gregory is one that has has resigned as well, but he's not an anti-pope. Yeah, there's a list of forty-two anti-popes. Okay. Really? Wow. Uh, Celestine the Fifth. Okay. Sylvester the Third. Clement the Second. 
Gregory the <coughs> Sixth, Martin the First, Benedict the Ninth, Silverius, Pontian, and then you come to Benedict the Sixteenth. Okay. Yeah, so so we got two Benedicts that have actually resigned. Now, so so resigning doesn't make you an anti-pope, though. Some of these uh, people were anti-popes, I believe. Right. Now, there was different circumstances. So I was reading up, and I can't keep track of names. So just like you get some of you have trouble with numbers, names are a problem for me, um, though I work at it. Um, so, so we have some of these situations. We had the time when there was three different popes, um, sort of vying for well, the papacy. I can't remember when that was. It was quite a long time ago, and you know, one of them resigned uh, in connection with that. So the other one was, you know, considered an anti-pope. I, I, I don't remember all the details, but you can see it's it's a bit of a complexity, right? So there is uh, space for a person to kind of jostle this calculation around. But I think the fact that he anticipated that the next one would be um, not the final one and that the one after him would have this unique name, I think is something that um, sort of fits this. now. I should say that when we look at this list and I'd said five or fall, really there's, if, if we're going to put the time of the end, the time of the ends in John Paul. So that would actually be six or fallen, not five. So that doesn't really work. Um, so it kind of made a misstatement there. So you got, if you said five are fallen, that would be your five that are fallen. One is, Right, that's your sixth name, Paul, and one is yet to come. And when he comes, he continues a short space. That's John Paul. And then you're going to have the eighth is going to come. That's going to be Francis, right? So that's the way that he was looking at this. So it doesn't really fit in with our 1989. Um, now, when did John Paul the first come? That would have been in. 1980? 78. 78, so way back even then. Okay, that makes sense, 78. Because I was in high school um, and I bought the book by Malachi Martin called uh, The Last, I um, can't remember the title of it, but it, it dealt with John Paul I and his death. Don't ask me why I bought that in high school. I have no idea because I didn't understand any of this kind of stuff back then. But... Uh, the Last Convocation, I think it was called, by Malachi Martin. Um, so then you got John Paul, the first comes at the end of uh, 1978. And then and then you have John Paul II, so in 78. And then um, you're going to have Reagan, I guess, is elected in 1980, right? And then John yeah, Paul. Yes, 80 to 88. Yeah. Yeah. And then they're going to work together. Now, there was all these things about, um, you know, the way that different people counted these popes. Uh, you know, so people who started with the Lateran Treaty, uh, they would look at, you know, John Paul when he had that as attempted assassination, um, which is something that Ronald Reagan also shared with Pope John Paul II. Um, they both had assassination attempts on them. Um, so, so it was kind of interesting, you know, that he receives the deadly wound, but the deadly wound is healed. People were doing all these types of speculations regarding uh, John Paul and also Reagan, right? So there was this idea that they somehow paralleled each other. I don't know if people remember all those types of speculations that were going on. But... Um, so, so we'd have to deal with the five are fallen. So this isn't going to put us into 1798. Uh, so the one is, how would you place Revelation 17 as the time of, I think it's Paul the sixth, right? Um, 
doesn't really fit in with our scenario then in this case. Okay. So you got all these different different posts here, and I, I just I hi guys. Here. Hi Mark. I say hi, and I've been so terrible. Sorry, I mean it's very very super late. I can't make it on it. Good time I miss four Fridays. You know, so sorry about that. And the Theodore, I ask you a very important question. Okay. Could you please help me to four cats up? Okay. It's okay. So just listen. I will I'll... let you go back talking. I don't care. Very too much stuff at all six for jogs in. I okay. got being in a house watch of 26 tricks. Okay. Anyway, I'll, I'll just try to review this a little bit. So we have these yeah, posts. I'll show, I will be in my house. And okay. I'm not ready to sit down. My brown chair that I will okay. tell you when okay, I, am, I am ready. Okay, that's fine, Mark. <laughs> Okay, so so when we look at these popes, uh, but the the one of the problems that that I had dealing with um, the way that people were counting the popes. So when you're counting them from the Lateran Treaty, uh, that was going to be in. Um, so the Lateran Treaty was in 1929, and you're going to have um, these. Uh, let me see who's the Pope during the Lateran Treaty. Um, that's going to be Pope Pius the Twelfth. Yeah. Okay. So or Pius the Eleventh. The Eleventh, right? Um, you know, there's a lot of popes here. Yeah. So you're going to have. Uh, Pope Pius the the eleventh is going to be during the Lateran Treaty. So you would say you're going to have five fallen. So that's going to be uh, Pope Pius the eleventh, Pius the twelfth, Pope John Paul the first is the fifth that has fallen. One is is going to be Pope John Paul and the second, and the one is yet to come is going to be the eighth. So that's going to be Bened or the seventh, pardon me, that's Benedict. And then Francis is the eighth. So that's the way some people counted it. The problem was how do you get, um, how do you get to the one that is? That, that's the real question. Because you can't just say, well, the one that, that happens to be right now is the one that is. Because you have to have something to mark that time. So how are you marking the time when there is the one that is? That's the problem. That's the problem uh, that that we have to address. And, and it, when it comes to the presidents, because we're going to do a similar thing with the presidents, because that's what Colin is doing. He's instead of taking the popes, he's taking the presidents. What he's doing is he's taking Daniel chapter 3, the head of gold, and dealing with the state um, or that that kingdom, the United States, that is going to be, uh, you know, modern Babylon, so to speak. He's going to take the Sunday law because we know Daniel chapter three is the Sunday law. And so he's going to take that statue that's completely gold and divide it up similarly to how we divide up the statue of, of Daniel two, except instead of it being the kingdom's it's going to be that kingdom, which is the sixth kingdom. So the sixth kingdom is the one that is. But you have a hard time doing this with the popes. That's sort of the, the problem that we have here. Yeah, especially if we're already at the last pope, number eight. So... Yeah, well, yeah, well, and if we're going to deal with the pope, the one that is, we have to have a time of the end to mark the one that is. That is, we have to say, how do we take Revelation 17 and transport John 
into whatever particular time we want. So we want them at a specific time. So let's go there again. So Revelation 17, we have to deal with this idea that five are fallen. There's seven kings, five are fallen, one is. So who is the one that is means that we have to put John at some particular time. Now it's easy to see that he's in 1798 the, or, or from 1798 to the time that he's in the kingdom of the United States. We can clearly see that based upon how this prophecy is unfolded. Right, so you're gonna see, he carries me away into the spirit in the wilderness. This is where we had gone and the question I'd asked, and we'd gone on this long journey, but is, sure. the wilderness is 17 verse three, the wilderness is what? Twelve sixty. It's the twelve sixty, right? Yeah. So we can see that the woman's in the wilderness, or this he's carried away into the wilderness, and he sees this woman sitting upon a scarlet colored beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. So, but we can see that this is different than the beast of Revelation thirteen, which is the papacy, because the woman here is the church, the beast is the state. And, and so this is dealing with this relationship of church and state, which is what's going to exist in connection with the Sunday law. So we're being brought to the time just before the Sunday law. I don't know. And the woman was arrayed in purple scarlet, so we know all of the characteristics of her. And the angel said unto me, therefore, wherefore didst thou marvel? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman and the beast that carries her, which hath the seven heads and ten horns. The beast that thou sawest was, and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit. So one of the things you're going to see is that there's this was, is not, and shall ascend, and go into perdition. Now, so this beast is has a certain characteristic. Now, we could say about uh, this, um, the papacy is not the beast here. Can, can we agree with that? I think I can see that. Yes. Because the woman's riding this beast. So how do we say that the beast was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit? How, how do we say that? What What is it that makes it is not? What is this beast specifically? I mean, it's connected with the papacy in some way, because we know the papacy received a deadly wound and the deadly wound's gonna be healed. So when it says the beast that was and is not, why is the beast not? Even he is the eighth and is of the seven and goeth into perdition. What does it mean the beast is not? It's not a state anymore. It just has religious authority, but no longer. Okay. Um, okay, so the beast that was Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, Rome, in both its pagan and papal phases, right? I mean, those are the heads. Now, now we have this beast, and we know that the heads are Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, and Rome. So these are the heads of the beast, right? Yes. That's how we understand it. Right. Okay. But the papacy ends up being one of those heads, isn't it? It's not, the beast is not the papacy. The beast is one of the heads. It could be a head on it, yeah. Okay. Can, can. And that head receives a deadly wound, right? And yeah. the deadly wound will be healed. Okay. So... 
so we have to understand what it means it is not and it is not because we have something that arises that is is different now when the united states becomes the beast is the woman riding the beast when the united states is the head that's in power no she's not okay so so why is the united states one of the heads Because what is the beast? Two horned beast? Is it two horned beast? Okay, well, the two horned beast comes up. So, see, in Revelation 13, we're given a similar view, but it's not the same, right? Because here, the beast is papal Rome. And the dragon gives its power unto the beast. The dragon power is pagan Rome. It gives us its power, its seat, and great authority, right, in verse 2. And then we see this other beast, the two horned beast. That's the United States. Because this is 1798. It arises. It has horns like a lamb, and it spake as a dragon, right, the second beast. And it's going to cause all that. It's going to give power. It, it had power to give life unto the image of the beast that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. So this power, this second beast, is going to make an image to the beast, and it's going to cause people to worship the image of the beast. If you don't, you're going to be killed. And it's going to deal with this mark. It causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark of the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 603 score and six. So we're looking at this, these two parallel chapters, and we can see that this, this two-horned beast is the United States. But in chapter 17, the focus is going to move from the United States to the next head, the next power. The United Nations. Yeah, it's going to move to the United Nations. Now, so that's why it says um, five are fallen, one is, the other is not yet come. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. And the beast that was and is not even he is the eighth and is of the seven and goeth into perdition so the beast that was and is not the question is why is he not how, how can we say that about the beast and how can we say that the beast even he is the eighth because we would say well the eighth is the papacy right so, so we have, in reading this, reading this very carefully, we start to see that we have to be, there's things that we have missed. There's things that we just sort of skip over. They don't, we don't see them. They don't fit in with what we're understanding. We kind of mix things together. We take Revelation 13 and 17 and think that it's the same kingdom, but we know it's not. It's not the same kingdom. Right? It's a different kingdom. It's a, it's a different beast, let's say. It's a different time. Revelation 12, it's not the same time. It has the same characteristics, some of the same characteristics, but it has different characteristics. And, and this is some of the things that we have to sort out. Now, um, I want to go through more of his paper here, but you, I see I'm taking up a lot of time to get this. So we're going to try to move through this really quickly just to finish this study. <clears throat> so he's going to accept the 1798. He's going to accept the 1290, all of these things. Um, 
This research has uncovered a striking parallel between the number 666 and the count of the Pope's numbers. The mathematics of this prophecy require an exactness which is met in the historic record. This prophecy is about to unfold before the whole world. As soon as the next papal election takes place, it will be seen to fit exactly with this prophecy. So he wrote this in 2002, or at least this was extracted from his website in 2002. But we can see in 1998, he had already had this caveat that the next pope could be an anti-pope, which hasn't hasn't quite demonstrated that, but it definitely could come true. You should be able to understand now that this prophecy says and knows what will soon take place. We are at the end of the short space, which will soon begin unfolding the last day events. The prophecies of the Holy Bible have never failed. They have exposed the beast and exposed the deceptions of Satan. So to me, the striking thing is the parallel between our movement and how we're looking at um, Donald Trump, right? So we have this same parallel. We've made a prediction. He's made a prediction about popes. We've made predictions about the presidents of the United States. And we then have to, to ask ourselves, was God leading us? And, and the question is, was God even leading Ralph Myers? And is there some complementary um, application that we can see? Now, one of the things when I, when I talked with him or chatted with him on Facebook, we had a big, long discussion back in June and July. Um, he didn't like what, and, and I think he ended up copying, commenting on one of my posts on one of the websites dealing with uh, the 666 years of Ezekiel. And he, he had, you know, he just said, you know, I can't agree with this because the 666 refers to popes. It doesn't refer to periods of time. But when we look at uh, the 1290, we know that the 1290 begins at the end of 666 years for Miller. So Miller counted 666 years, which is on the 1843 chart, from 158 BC to 538 AD, an ordinal count of 666 years. And there is another count, of course, that we could put from uh, 129 BC to, which would be a cardinal count to 538. But let's just take Miller's. Miller has these 666 years. We also have Ezekiel showing that that 666 is a transition, a number that comes from Babylon, Babylonian mysticism, that from Jehoiachin's captivity to the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD by Rome. That is, Leviticus 26 points out the siege that Ezekiel uses to count from in 597 and Deuteronomy 28 talks about Roman siege in 70 AD and those two sieges are 666 years apart and so that count from Ezekiel gives us this 666 with 36 years at either end so so we can see that there's this transition for the papacy to have the number 666 you need these periods of 666 years to bring it to the papacy. That is, you need the transition from Babylon, from paganism, Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, and pagan Rome, to then have papal Rome have this symbol in the first place. And then that's going to start with, with Miller's, with the taking away of paganism in 508. And so that 1290 that's going to then end in 1798 is now where he's going to be counting this 666. So can you see that this is a mirror? 666 at the beginning, 666 at the end. And, and I tried to show him this, that what he was doing, what I'm doing, doesn't contradict what he's doing. It would add to it. But he was kind of a difficult guy to deal with. So he, he didn't want to have anything to do with anything I had to say. And so, you know, he didn't, he didn't accept it, but he could have, he could have, if he had taken the time, he could have seen that this complements what he's saying. Now, he's gonna, I'm gonna skip a little bit here because I wanna get through this. So 
he's kind of repeating what we've talked about. He's going to take the names here. He's going to add them up. The count of an antipope was set by the liturgical record to be zero. So whenever the record has deviated from this rule, the correct rule is applied. So he's taken out all the antipopes. Now, Benedict XVI is not officially an antipope yet, but maybe he will be declared one. Now, he's going to say about the five are fallen. Five are fallen. One is the sixth. The other is not yet come. In Daniel 7, 6, it portrays a leopard beast that has four heads. These four heads are the four divisions that Alexander's Grecian empire was divided into and given to his four generals. These four heads are also Grecian. Each had control of a portion of the parent empire. These were Cassandra, Lysimachus, Ptolemy, and Seleucus. Um, the, this serves as a model of how the seven heads of Revelation 17 are to be seen. The seven heads of the papal beast are also the papal empire and are not as many assumed the ancient empires which have no relation to the papal beast. So he makes this mistake. If we are going to make an application of the prophecy in the present, do we not have to understand its interpretation in the past? That is, yes, yes we do, yeah. If we reject Revelation 17 as referring to the ancient empires, we're making an error. That is, we're rejecting light that was given in the past. And that light given in the past would help us in the present to interpret things correctly. Now, we know that Colin doesn't do that in his application. And this movement has not done that. We don't go back and say, well, this interpretation that we've had that was established that Ellen White supports is wrong. And we're just going to come up with a new interpretation. We see that history is being repeated. And there's no need for him to make this statement that the seven heads are not the ancient empires. You could take this and say, here we have another application, but he doesn't do that. And, and that would actually help guide him. Now, this was part of the problem that Colin was facing with Daniel Fontenot when uh, Colin presented this. Because Daniel Fontenot says, well, you know, five are fallen. And, and the one that's going to be the eighth has to be the fifth, because that's what we have in the pattern of those seven kingdoms. It's going to be the fifth that receives the deadly wound, right? And it's going to be the one that's resurrected. But Colin was saying, well, the verse doesn't say that. We, even though we're making an application and we're comparing it to the past, we're also using other verses. Daniel chapter 11. Uh, and, and of course, Daniel chapter 3. So we're not just using Daniel chapter 2. And the 8th just has to be of the 7. So that's his argument. It doesn't have to be, who would it have been, Clinton or something, that's going to be the 8th. It would just have to be one of those that's going to be uh, the 8th. And he says, well, Trump is the one that's going to be the 8th. Right? <clears throat> So the eighth head, so when he talks of this, of the seven that goes into perdition, the eighth head stands apart from the seven because he is the Antichrist. He comes in his own name, thereby yielding the final one to the cumulative count of 665. Nothing makes a prophetic message more urgent than knowing it is being fulfilled now. At the time of the papal election, following the end of John Paul II, it will be clear that the prophecy has been followed accordingly, and the loud cry will commence. It is time now to study this interpretation completely. So when this does occur, the wheels of action will be in place and the time not wasted. So we can see here uh, the parallel to this movement in that his is, isn't a time prediction, but it is a prediction. And it's a prediction like our Trump prediction that, that has a limitation to it. Now, it didn't happen the way that he said, but he had that caveat, right? That, that, that the next one could be an anti-pope. And so that's what he's trying to say about Benedict XVI. We're not going to count him. And then when Francis came into power, we now had something that nailed down 666. So you can see from his perspective, he has something that says Francis is the last one. 
Now, again, I'm not saying that I, I think he's correct because there could be other things that we don't consider. But we can see the parallel with what we have done and with what he's doing. And the question is, can we do that? Can he do this? Um, so he makes, there's some other statements that, you know, the seven heads of the seven names of popes, he's just kind of repeating himself. Um, and so he says there's 79 different names used by the popes. There have been only seven names of popes since used in 1798. The beast number is 666 and is the number of a man. The beast has seven heads and are seven mountains and are seven kings. With these seven names or heads, the cumulative count comes to 665 with John Paul II. Table one below is calculated by adding up each number of their names in a mountain fashion. Pope Paul, so when he says in a mountain fashion, um, he's, he's building this up, adding them up on top of each other. Thus, the kingdom or mountain of a head consists of all the numbers of the valid popes of that name added up. The names of the seven heads are beside their respective number. Now, there's a number of things about this. Uh, I mean, we can see clearly what he's doing. Um, you know, there's a bunch of little arguments that he makes that aren't that important. He's kind of repeating himself here. Um, talks about the hills of Rome um, and literal applications and why... <laughs> So here, here's a good paragraph. The false interpretation that the explanation of a symbol must always be literal, it falls into the ground the moment it can be shown that symbols are sometimes explained by substituting for them other symbols and then explaining the latter, as in this case. The seven heads are seven mountains, right? So we have seven heads, there's seven mountains. Well, we don't look for seven literal mountains. And the woman is that great city. It is not difficult to show that the mountains and the city are also symbols. We are informed in Revelation 13 that one of the seven heads is wounded to death. This head, therefore, cannot be a literal mountain, for it would be folly to speak of wounding a mountain to death. Each of the seven heads has a crown upon it. But whoever saw a literal mountain with a crown upon it? The seven heads are evidently successive in order of time, for we read five are fallen and one is, and the other is not yet come. Now, of course, these actually heads don't have crowns. That is, which ones, which which of the beasts, 12, 13, and 17, do the heads have crowns? Which which beast has crowns on its heads? Is one of them pagan? Yeah, pagan Rome, Revelation 12. Which one has crowns on its horns? Which are going to be 10 crowns. Modern uh, Rome. Yeah, that would be pagan, uh, papal Rome. So that's Revelation 13, has crowns mm -hmm. on its horns. But Revelation 17 doesn't have crowns at all. Right? Because it's received no kingdom as, as of yet. So, so these types of details, he hasn't really considered. He's, he's conflating some of these things together. He's looking at the beast in Revelation 17 as being the same as the beast in Revelation 13, and in a sense as being the same in the beast as Revelation 12. He hasn't distinguished that. But he is making a good point here that symbols... When a symbol is explained, it can be explained by a symbol. And when he talks about literal, that is, once you, you interpret that symbol, you're interpreting it into something that's literal, right? It, it's, you're not mixing literal and spiritual. You're just saying, now that I know that the symbol is something, it represents the United States. The United States is a literal thing. It's not a symbol in that case. But the thing that symbolizes it, the earth, that's a symbol. But you could take the symbol and explain it with another symbol that just adds to it. It gives you some more detail, but it doesn't doesn't mean that you're uh, that you have to take the the first explanation as literal. 
but the seven heads are seven mountains so that you think well this refers to the city of rome it can't it can't be doing that according to daniel 7 6 compared to daniel 8 8 22 heads denote governments and according to daniel 2 35 and 44 and jeremiah 51 25 mountains denote kingdoms according to these facts a literal translation of revelation 17 9 and 10 removes all obscurity the seven heads are seven mountains upon which the woman sitteth and are seven kings it will be seen that the angel represents the heads as mountains and then explains that mountains to be seven successive kings the meaning is transferred from one symbol to another and then an explanation is given of the second symbol from the foregoing argument it follows that the woman cannot represent a literal city for the mountains upon which the woman sitteth or women sits being symbolic a literal city cannot sit upon symbolic mountains further evidence of identifying the whore babylon is found in revelation chapters 13 and 17. god tells his people to count the number of the beast he elaborates more on the nature of this beast with the description of it having seven heads being also seven mountains and seven kings there must be a connection between the seven heads and the count of the 666 man as seen in table two, the period of the time the beast starts in 1798. Since that time, there have been seven different names of the heads of the Catholic Church. Add the numbers of all those popes of these seven heads and count stands at 665. When the count reaches 666, that man whose count is one is the Antichrist. So, so his argument then is, we're not going to count Benedict, but we're going to count Francis. Now, back in 2002 we don't even have benedict yet benedict the 16th and we definitely don't have francis so i don't know what people are going to think about this but you can see if we're going to look at the study of colin in, in more detail that this is one of the things that we needed to look at we looked at the true interpretation of 12 13 and 17 and and we're going to delve deeper into those things. We also have to look more deeply into other studies. So other studies that we talked about that we need to look at um, is uh, the study relating to uh, the seven kings of Judah, the seven kings of Persia, right? Those are going to give us more light regarding the seven presidents correct yes yeah seven kings of israel other sevens and eights in the bible what they represent so so again you know this is just a little piece of the puzzle i, I mean i find it very fascinating i don't know if he's correct i mean time would tell but he does parallel what's happened with this movement in that as we move through a prophecy and we start to see more detail um and 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 i and i still tend to lean towards that god was leading him in his initial uh, application of this idea and that maybe there's more that we're going to see as time goes on but i also have the problem of the timing you know five are fallen one is where do you get to the point to say, well, the one is where, how are you going to place that? That would be the problem for me. A any final comments on this before we close with prayer? He talks about the anti the last Pope being the Antichrist, but when you read first john 4 verse 3 and every yeah. spirit that confesses that not that confesses not that jesus christ is coming to flesh is not of god and this is the spirit of antichrist therefore we have heard that it should come and even now already is is in the world that's in john's time so. yes okay so but that doesn't go against what he's saying true true because we know that the spirit of antichrist that is the papal spirit because it's a rejection of the gospel 
the papacy does not believe that Jesus Christ came in the flesh. That he came in holy flesh. So much so that his mom had to have holy flesh. Yeah. Right? He had to yeah. be conceived of, of the Holy Spirit so that she didn't have a sinful flesh so that she could then give birth to Jesus. You know, so they don't just even have Jesus having holy flesh. You have to have the immaculate conception. So, so Mary has to be immaculate without sin because they take sin as being the flesh, right? So original sin, Mary can't have any of that in order to give birth to Jesus because Jesus can't be born of a woman who has original sin. So, so you can see that that is the spirit of Antichrist that has already come into the world in John's time. This, this idea, this Gnosticism that was developing and, and um, does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so the antichrist, and when we talk about the antichrist, I mean, I would normally say that the antichrist is Satan himself when he comes and personates Christ. And that's true also. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I don't know if I would have said that he's the Antichrist. I would just say he's the Pope that exists when the Sunday law comes. And, and that could be the case. I mean, we, but we also know that we're in a typical line. So we, we would have to figure out how this fits. I mean, we can see that it fits with 1798 and these, these popes at the end and this number 666. But we're not at the end yet. That is, we haven't had the Sunday law. If we had the Sunday law and Benedict becomes an anti-pope, he, he gets some kind of punishment for what he's done, then, you know, we, we would say, well, he was correct. But it, it's a very interesting study, not from his conclusion, but the process in which he goes through and how he's looking at it. Because it's very similar in some ways to what we have done. It has some differences. And, and, the, and as we look at these different lines, uh, we might start to find that there's, I wouldn't say mistakes that we made, but things that we didn't see. That, that to me is what, that I, what I, I am in the house now. Okay, Mark. Well, we're just going to close with prayer now. Um, could you repeat again, please? No, uh, I can't. I do it again. I can't. No, I have to, I have to go. So, so we're going to close with prayer. So, uh, any final comments, any final, has this study been helpful? It's raised some interesting questions. Yeah, it, it, it's raising questions. It doesn't give us a lot of answers yet, but for me, it raised questions as I looked at this and, and, and I've been looking at this for a while, thinking about it especially in the context of, of our message. But when Colin brought up, again, Revelation 17, I felt we had to address this. So uh, let's close with prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we are so thankful for the Sabbath. We're thankful for the time that we can have in fellowship. We know, Lord, that um, we have many things to learn, many things to unlearn. Um, we pray that you can be with us on this Sabbath. Uh, we pray for Dwight's study tomorrow morning. Um, and uh, we pray for all of the studies that this movement is participating in um, and our individual studies with others. We just ask, Lord, that you can instruct us, that we can be taught of you. Help us to be teachable and recognize that just because you've taught us something in the past doesn't mean that um, God is not teaching others and even correcting some of our ideas. We pray for this movement. We pray for each individual, for the struggles that they face. And we ask that you can um, unite us to Christ, that we can be united to one another. Thank you for hearing our prayer, for being with us this evening. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.